Good evening. All right, we're going to finish up Hosea and go into Joel this evening. So have your Bibles ready for that. Hosea and Joel. All right. Is everybody's ready? You'll, uh, let's take a second and I'll lead us in a prayer and we'll get started. Let's pray. Well, God and Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity to gather together in the midst of a, a sinful world, in, a, in the midst of chaos. We're, we're thankful for the, this avenue of peace and prayer and worship and study. We're thankful for the blessings that we have in Christ and we're thankful for the knowledge that you have given us. Father, help us to be wise in this life. As we look into your word tonight, help us to, to learn and to apply the truths that we need to to our lives. And we ask you to be with the teachers and students tonight and help us all to learn and to be faithful to you. We're so thankful for Jesus. And all these things we pray in his name. Amen. All right, so just getting right into it, the last part of Hosea, as we talked about the, <clears throat> the judgment of God toward Ephraim is sealed, and, and the things that he had warned them against are going to come to pass, but even in the midst of this judgment, the prophets often talk about a, a hope in, in the Messiah, and that's what chapter 14 is going to talk about now. The, the future restoration of Israel is really the, the immediate context in Hosea 14, and the call in verse 1 of chapter 14 is, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. And so we have a, a call for repentance. And in verses 1 and 2, talk about, you know, essentially what the, the prophets have been uh, saying all along is to, to put away your idols and put away your iniquity and return to the Lord. And it's... It's interesting that this would be at the end of a book that's already sealed the fate of northern Israel, of Ephraim, uh, or Israel, and, and then it has, it has a call to return to the Lord, which is, you know, it's not going to happen in the immediate context of Ephraim, okay? They're going to get carried away by Assyria, and then they're going to be dissolved into the, into history, they're going to be dispersed, and we're never going to hear from those tribes again in is Israel's history. But the interesting part is now the, there is still salvation that is talked about even amidst this impending judgment, and the the call in verse two says, "Take words with you." and return to the Lord, say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. All right. So you think about the, the temple and you think about the, the reason why Israel was unfaithful. It, it wasn't because they weren't offering or, or, or uh, were going to a temple, they were going to uh, the wrong one in the north. And even in Judah, there was uh, sinf sinfulness and idolatry present, even though they had the temple uh, in Jerusalem standing. Uh, the problem was they weren't worshiping God in their heart. Okay, they were, they were removed from God and they were full of idols and the idols had carried them off away from God. And so you have, in the first couple verses, the, the temple language. Okay, we're talking about returning to the Lord, but the way you think about uh, the, the process of offering a, 
a sin sacrifice to the temple. Somebody explain briefly what the process was whenever an Israelite sinned um, uh, and they had to uh, kill an animal for their sacrifice. What did they, what did they do? After, where did they have to sacrifice the animal to? The, to the temple, right? They had to bring their sacrifice to the priest. Okay, they would slaughter them, the, the, the sacrifice in front of the altar. And then the, the priest would uh, go through the process depending on what kind of sacrifice it was. But they would carry this sacrifice to the altar. And they would, that's the presence of God. They carry their sacrifice, they carry their sin before the Lord, and then he forgives them of their sin from, by this blood sacrifice. And so the words that we're using, it's not talking about a physical sacrifice, but it's talking about the, the motions of carrying uh, a sacrifice or an offering to the Lord in his temple. But instead of an animal sacrifice, what are they supposed to take to the Lord? Words, okay. They're carrying words to the Lord. Now, the, all all along, the the problem, the the you know, the main problem that the prophets had with the worship of Israel is they were. And sometimes it looked like they were doing the right thing, but what what was their problem inside? They weren't worshiping God with what their heart. Okay, their heart. So. You know, you think about worshiping God with your heart and, and how it reflects our words and how it reflects um, our actions. And so the, the real call here in the first couple of verses is, is sort of like the, the prophecy in Jeremiah where he said, there will be a time where I will write my words on their heart, right? They will know me. They will worship me with their heart and their mind because that's where my words will be written. The word has always been important in worship in the Old Testament and the New Testament because the words are um, akin to the knowledge of God as Hosea has been talking about the whole time. The knowledge of God is how they are being destroyed because they have left the knowledge. But at the end, there's this reminder of of the knowledge of God. It's the words, all right? So the words, take words with you, return to the Lord, and say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. Okay, so whenever it, it's talking about bringing your words to the Lord, what are we offering if we bring his words? And if you give you a hint, the answer's on the screen, you know. I'll make it easy for you. What are we bringing to him? Praise, okay? Praise is an umbrella term, all right? Yes, we praise God, but when we praise God, what it's reflective, really, of our, the totality of our faith, okay? If we praise God, you know, as uh, you know, Paul, Paul said, no one can call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit of God, okay? And so if we praise God with, with a right heart, it's going to be reflective in... Um, our worship, okay? And it's also going to be reflective in our faith. So the words, really, when he's talking about bringing words to the Lord, it's representative of a total faithfulness, all right? Their faithfulness is what they're bringing to God, and the words are their vow to God. It's sort of like him. Uh, the Hebrew writer says, through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. In the Old Testament, the continual process of sacrifice is because they always sin again. And they, every time you sin, you offer up another sacrifice, another vow, another commitment. You know, blood is to be shed again. And in the New Testament, we offer up daily the sa a sacrifice, but it's the sacrifice of words. And the words are reflective of our faith. So we're being faithful to God. This is a... This is a um, an issue of faithfulness towards Israel. Show how faithful you are daily by praising God every day and being faithful to Him throughout your life. And this is contrast to the way that Israel has currently been acting away from God with idolatry in their heart 
and far from him, ignorant of the knowledge of God, subject to the wrath and judgment of God because they didn't repent. And this is future and, and reflective of what is going to come future. Okay, Remember, the, the prophets often prophesy in um, the here and now, but also a, a sliver of the, the time under the Messiah. Okay, that was what their anticipation was in the Old Testament, the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. And so when we prophesy in the Old Testament, there's the, the here and now, which is the judgment that Hosea has um, been talking about. And then there is the future under the Messiah where all of that is forgiven and restored. And this is an image of that in, in, in chapter 14. So you could say it's an image because this is, you know, this is the northern kingdom that we're talking about primarily here. So you could say this is, is primarily an image of the future kingdom under the Messiah, where we offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, where the, 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 the words of our uh, mouth are reflective of the words of our heart, okay? And they're not separate like they were in Israel's rebellion, where the words of their mouth were different from the words of their heart. Their hearts were far from him, even though their mouths were saying something, something else. So this is a reflection of that. This is, and the vocabulary that you're using here is a prediction of, of blessing for a, uh, uh, a future nation, a future generation. Okay, so how does that give hope, like we said last time, to the, the current reader? Well. There are those in every nation, and when, even when the nation itself is pronounced in judgment under God, there's always the individual that God saves. He doesn't, he doesn't destroy the individual with the nation, okay? Even though, you know, they're part of the nation, there's always going to be a remnant of God's people, okay? And so the remnant in, in, in Old Testament language is always connected to the future under the Messiah, or the future kingdom, or the future nation, where there's going to be words like, you know, uh, salvation and restoration, uh, and then all the metaphors that have to do with life. Um, and so in verse 3, is, Assyria will not save us, we will not ride on horses, nor will we say again our God to the work of our hands, for you, in, for in you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. He will shoot his, he, he, his shoots will sprout, and his beauty will be like the olive tree, and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. Um, those who live in his shadow will rise again, uh, will again raise grain, and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. Okay, so this is all language that just repeats the, um, the life and the prosperity that's in the Lord, okay, in faithfulness. All right, and this is, you know, the, the physical prosperity in Old Testament Israel was directly paralleled in their minds with the blessings from God, okay? It was more of a spiritual blessing from God than we would like to think of today. Everything that they had physically back then, they thought of as being provided by God. And so whenever their crops prospered, you know, whenever they had the things that they needed in their life, it was reflective of their spiritual prosperity as well. And, you know, we see a little of that mentality in Job. When Job was afflicted, they thought, well, he must be sinful. And that's the kind of mentality that they had, so this is language they would understand. Spiritual fruitfulness um, and the way we take it um, is only possible through faithfulness okay and removing idolatry from our hearts and removing the hypocrisy from our hearts and letting the words of our mouth match the words of our heart um, worshiping in spirit and truth and so you know it's interesting that this is the same location 
that Hosea is prophesying at that future, you know, Jesus is going to talk to the woman at the well. All right, on that same mountain, there was the capital of uh, the north, Ephraim, and that's where they offered their their sacrifices, and that's where they would go to worship on that mountain, the Samaritans. All right, and that's where the conversation came from, from Jesus. All right, so the the last couple verses, O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like a luxuriant cypress, and from me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. And you'll notice, you know, as we end, you know, as the, the literature of the prophets often do, um, it talks about wisdom and discerning and righteousness and, and walking in the ways of the Lord uh, at the very end. Um, but at the very beginning, um, it talks about how they are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Okay, they aren't walking in the ways of the Lord. They're, they're, un, they're, they're, uh, they're naked spiritually, as Hosea was told to walk around, you know, for for three days naked, you know, to talk about the spiritual nakedness uh, and unfaithfulness. And so there's a bookend, and at the end it's good, you know, because that's a reminder that the Lord is a faithful God and his blessings come from uh, obeying his commandments and, and from faithfulness. So, uh, is there any, any questions about Hosea before we move forward? All right. Now, as far as um, books go, Joel is very short. It's only three chapters, and so it, it shouldn't take long for us to get through Joel. Um, and if you'll look up on the screen here, it's, it's just a reminder that Joel, if Hosea is here, all right, and, that, and Joel is not too far from him in terms of time frame. So they would have been uh, pretty close uh, contemporaries who if they knew each other, uh, we don't know, but generally, you know, Joel is thought to um, have prophesied in the south in Judah where Hosea would have been in the north, all right? Whether they would have crossed paths uh, we don't know, but they would have been contemporaries, and, and generally, um, prophets had, you know, strangely enough, their own areas. You know, if you look at it on a map of the the areas that are mentioned in their books, um, so Joel is is right around Jeroboam uh, the second's reign in Israel, and he is, of course, of. Uh, uh, under the divided kingdom, uh, that's the minor prophets are primarily divided kingdom prophets, and so you can you can tell already if it's Jeroboam, there's going to be a lot of uh, prophecies about uh, wickedness and idolatry. All right, so when we think about Joel, the the name itself, Joel, is shortened for. Jehovah is God, okay? Um, and that was his message, all right? So whether they get the name from the message or the message from the name, uh, probably both, but um, he was likely a prophet of Judah. Now, when we think about Joel, we don't really for certain uh, know when he prophesied. Um, most people place him in an early date. Some people place him, uh, early would be about 830 B.C. Um, but some people, because of the type of symbolism that he uses, is, is more similar um, to different kinds of uh, national armies, um, 
they place them at a later date, like 500 BC. Um, not 100%, but based on the internal evidence, where they placed him in the canon, where he, it, you know, where the book of Joel sits in the Bible, and the parallels in the book, the, the early date, 850, 830 BC, is, is probably your best bet. Um, it doesn't really matter uh, as far as uh, the message goes. The message is still the same one way or the other, uh, but it would change the placement of, of you know, who is around and the king that was around while he was, uh, uh, while it was written. Now, writing doesn't necessarily mean that it determines when the events happen. Okay. We have that all the time in the New Testament. So it could have been written later, um, or it could have been written as the events were occurring or before the events were occurring, like the Gospels. The Gospels were written much later than the actual events, okay? but they're still true nonetheless, so uh, we shouldn't have to worry about that. The, the main point is the theme in Joel which is God's judgment and the need for Israel to repent. Uh, pretty common theme. I mean, in the prophets, that's why they were sent. Okay, they were sent to, to, to warn, to prophesy, to, to call uh, the nations to repent. Uh, Every one of them had, had their own message, but that's essentially what the, the message is. God's judgment on sin and the need for repentance before um, it's too late. You find an interesting parallel here. Plagues were common, in the, and still are, in the, the Near East. Locust swarms are common, still, but the, uh, the, the amount or the the type and the, you know, the reason for the plagues uh, are not always intentional, you know. But this locust plague is, um, it, most people take it as a symbol of the invading army, okay, that's coming in. But locusts swarm. All right, and when locusts get into the crops, they eat everything. Remember, when we think about locusts, um, you know, locusts are pretty familiar in the Old Testament because that's one of the plagues in Egypt, right? And so, whatever the hail didn't destroy. The locusts did, and they ate all the rest of the vegetation. Okay, so they'll eat everything, um, whatever they, is left, right? And so the, the, the metaphor for uh, the, the locusts um, destroying the vegetation then is the, 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 the kind of destruction that is awaiting for wherever the locusts are going, right? In this case, Israel. So we have uh, locust as a symbol of, of judgment, a vehicle of judgment. And it talks about, of course, the blessings for repentance, which is always a call back to the blessings that were given under Moses and the curses under Moses. When you think about curses and blessings, you only have to remember what the original covenant was all about. You know, the original covenant was you will be blessed if you follow me and you will be cursed like the other nations if you don't. Um, and then I will, you know, destroy you from the land that I promised to give you. But if you repent, well, then, you know, I will wipe away your tears and I will restore you and you will be my people and I will be your God. So you have a judgment of nations. Nations in the Old Testament always talk about everybody except Israel and when you think about nations think about Gentiles if you're looking at the New Testament um, every time it says nations in the Old Testament if your Bible, Bible translates it like that you're talking about all of the uh, 
the nations surrounding Israel that God warned them not to be involved with, you know, not to worship their gods and not to marry their, um, their wives, their, their women for wives and that kind of thing. So nations is always a, a word for um, enemies of God in a way. So you have, you have that um, judgment of nations and it's actually the, the very thing that they were involved in that God uses for his wrath against them. You say your sin is what destroys you and that's exactly how God uses the nations. Their involvement with the nations eventually becomes their destruction. Um, all right. So in the very beginning of Joel, you have the devastation of locusts. Um, Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locusts have left, the swarming locusts have eaten. And what the swarming locusts have left, the creeping locusts has eaten. And what the creeping locusts have left, the stripping locusts has have eaten. So they had a lot of uh, bugs, and four or five of them were all called locusts, although they'd probably be classified differently today. Um, but, you know, in there, probably some sort of aphid and some sort of grasshopper, uh, and then actual, you know, locusts, as you would think about locusts. But creeping locusts and stripping locusts, there's no real. Uh, definition for that in English so they really don't know what kind of bug it was they just know that in, in terms of you know the destruction they're just going to call them locusts since they use the same word in Hebrew but it's obviously a different bug because they have a different function um, and so it really it's just talking about the total destruction that that is a uh, that is coming the devastation of this locust plague so you think you're out of it from the swarm, but then, you know, the crawling locusts come, and the biting locusts, and the stripping locusts, and, you know, all the, the, all the gnawing locusts. You know, the gnawing locusts is what I think I'd be more worried about. Maybe they were mosquitoes, but we don't know. So, okay, what's the call for verse 5? Wake up, right? Okay, wake up, and that's... Uh, that's a pretty common expression, too, in the Bible. Wake up, all right? When you wake up, you, you can see what's around you. You can see your situation that you're in. And sin is often referred to as being in a state of, of sluggardness or a state of sin, a state of uh, darkness and, and sleepiness, um, lethargy. So when you wake up, it's, an, it's a self-examination and it's a call to look at their sin and, and understand w what kind of mess that they're in. All right, when you think about locusts, and I had this up in the wrong slide, but we'll go ahead and talk about it. In Exodus 10, the eighth plague talks about a swarm of locusts that consumed what was left after the hill. Um, now, why, why was there a locust plague during that time? What was the purpose of that, or the cause? Okay, so it was a kind of a reoccurring theme because, you know, as the, the very poetic, you know, but, you know, uh, Pharaoh repented, as it said in some, and he decided, I will not let your people go, and he hardened his heart before the Lord. Just that God said he would, but um, they were sent to, you know, prod him to wake up. You know, this is real, this is happening, there's only one God, and he's destroying everything that defines Egypt as a nation. He was destroying all of their gods, one by one, and it was a judgment on idolatry. Okay, the locusts, the plagues, all of them were focused and centered on the idols of Egypt. And in God's mind, that is the worst possible blaspheme. Okay? 
it was because of the idols that you know you find a lot of these immoral practices. But at the heart of it were that God that the people were, you know, worshiping false idols. And so idols are obviously a huge problem. You know, the bane of uh, of Israel's existence are idols. And so we still have the same problem. You know. And the minor prophets are coming out and, and calling Israel to, you know, tear down your groves. These places in, you know, the, the woods, you know, faces on trees where they would go and worship Gaia or all the, the tree gods and the goddess of fertility and the, the Baals. And, you know, their high places, they called to be torn down where they would go up and uh, literally go up on a, a temple where they would probably sacrifice their children and offer... Uh, sacrifices there. Um, tear, tear down all your asherim, you know. Uh, remove all your idols before you. But they had, for the most part, idols in their heart. And that is the, the that is where God is focused in these judgments. The destruction of the idols is always going to be parallel with the destruction of of the person who worships idols. So unless that person repents and puts away the idols, then they too, the idols that are in their heart, are also going to be torn down. And the way that God did that in the Old Testament is by sending you know, foreign invaders. In this case, uh, not physical locusts, but armies, uh, a foreign nation. And, and in verse 6, uh, it talks about that for a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number, its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. All right. When you think about lion, um, that's why, and some commentators' minds, this places it more in 500, where you're gonna find nations like Persia or Greece, you know, the leopard, as in Daniel's prophecy. All right, so you have, you know, lions are pretty common animals in this area at the time. And think about the teeth of a lion, uh, the fangs, of course, um, the ferociousness of this, this invasion um, is going to be uh, incredible. And so what do a lot of nations you either come in and you occupy all right and you set your own capital and you plant your own people and you dispose of the nation that is there or you subject them uh, as servants um, in your in your uh, empire or you do what these people do and a lot of like similar uh, in the future, you go in and you destroy everything. You lay waste to everything and you make it so, it, not only that, but you make it so it's not even inhabitable anymore. Because their gods are not your gods. And so, to them, you're false and, and they're going to destroy not only your holy places, but your, your women and your children and everybody who called on the name of Yahweh or they think, and they're going to destroy that, and they're going to raise every town, and they're going to put salt in the ground, and, and sow salt in the ground so not even vegetation can grow. And they're going to set fire to everything, and so uh, they'll take the spoil. But you think about destruction. Um, the picture here is, uh, I don't know how to compare it, except you, know, you, you think about what a town looked like before a huge tornado goes through, right? And then after you see pictures, it's like you can't even recognize, you can see where the, you know, the, the, the foundations were and everything, but there's nothing standing anymore and there's just a complete obliteration. That's the kind of image that you get here um, from this invading army because it was something that was familiar in that, in that time. These are things that they can understand. These were fears that they had all the time, but that the problem is, uh, before, under the covenant, they had the Lord on their side to protect them from invaders. It was kind of like a spiritual force field, you know. Uh, their faithfulness to God um, assured that, you know, he would be their protector. 
But once that stopped, um, then it's like, you know, force field's gone and all bets are off. So uh, faithfulness is what guards people from destruction. That's the message. Faithfulness is what guards us from destruction. Uh, putting idols away and being faithful to God uh, is, is like that. It's, um, it's a covenant relationship. And so you have a, a lot of descriptions about destruction here. The, the field is ruined in verse uh, 11. The, uh, the, the grapes are ruined. The wheat is ruined. 12, the vine is ruined, the fig is ruined, everything's dried up. In verse 13, now everybody's girding themselves with sackcloth um, in mourning because of all the, the ruin and uh, all the things that they have lost. Okay, so it doesn't take long for Joel to get started, does it? I mean, this is just, usually you have kind of a theme building up to the destruction, but this is Three chapters, and Joel gets right into this destruction. All right. And so we have uh, this morning in verse 13. But in verse 13 and 14, uh, who is called to uh, initiate this Time of mourning and, and weeping. The, the priests, okay? So the priests are mentioned, um, and also uh, the priests of the altar. All right, so you have the, the Levitical priesthood, you have the, the priest uh, lineage, all the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders of Israel are called to, to lead this uh, mourning, to lead this repentance. Um, Spend the night in sackcloth, okay? So this is a call to repentance, and it's starting right off, okay? Destruction is at your doorstep. You know, you priest, you're responsible for the people, you're responsible for the temple, um, you're responsible for reminding the people to be faithful, um, and they're also responsible for um, leading this uh, lament and this crying out, okay? In Ezra 10, and this is future, or this is after uh, captivity and, and as they're returning to Jerusalem. Ezra 10.1, Ezra led the priests and the Levites in confession. Okay, the priests were focal because they are the representatives of the nation. Okay, so you have the priests and the Levites and the people in confession um, and repentance through fasting and weeping. Well... That's great, a little too late, but you know, that just shows that even after the fact, you know, God was good on his promise, okay? The, the remnant are gonna return and they're gonna worship God. Of course, they rebuild uh, Jerusalem and the, the temple and they repopulate the area. Um, but, you know, the prophet's duty function is to, you know, warn them in advance um, and maybe prevent this from happening. Of course, we see the, the effects early on in Joel, um, and it kind of echoes what Amos, you know, talks about. We'll talk about Amos, too. God sends judgment and he often does so in, in ways like famine and drought uh, in order to prod them, to wake them up, to turn them around, to get them to repent. But as, as you, we see here, as we will find out later in Amos, they will not repent. Um, but it's always the same message. Don't harden your heart. Repent and turn to the Lord. And so. Who better to start that than the, the religious leaders of the nation? But that's where we're going to stop. We'll pick back up in, in chapter 2 next time uh, of Joel. So have, have that read. We'll probably finish it up. Uh, not next week, but week after next. Remember, next week is meeting.
So in two weeks. If you would, let us turn and sing number 361, number 361. <clears throat> Next to number four five one. Four five one. <clears throat> Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I'm sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so when I am sad he makes me glad he's my friend Jesus is all the world to me my friend in trial sore I go to him for blessings and he gives them o'er and o'er he sends the sun and the rain he sends the heart this golden grain sunshine and rain harvest of grain he's my friend Jesus is all the world to me I want no better friend I trust him now I'll trust him when Last leading day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my
going to turn over to Matthew chapter 13. We'll be looking over there for just a moment or two. <clears throat> Some of you may be aware that we had a solar eclipse Monday. You might have heard something about it. Our company was preparing us for weeks. They act like it was the end of times. We were supposed to prepare patients for this and because they didn't know if we were going to have gasoline and shortages and so forth. So they were wanting us very prepared, so we did our due diligence and we're ready. And probably some of you got to see it. If you did like me, there was a break in the clouds and you got to see the moon passing in front. Now we didn't have in front of the, the sun, we didn't have the total darkness like a lot of people did, but we did have uh, enough to see it and it was a, it was a neat experience. Um, solar eclipses happen pretty often Comparatively speaking, but you've got to be really in the middle of the ocean to see a lot of them are in the, the poles. Um, but occasionally, they do happen. I was thinking about eclipses this week, and what about a spiritual solar eclipse? Have you ever thought about that? What is it that blocks out our sun, our son of God? Because there are things in life that eclipse us sometimes on a daily basis. If you look at the verb eclipse, it says to make another person or thing seem much less important, good or famous. And then you look at the noun, it says an observing, obscuring of the light from one celestial body by the passage of another between it and the observer or between it and its source of illumination. So Jesus is our son, he is our source of illumination. But there are things in life that come in between us. So when we think each of us each day, what is eclipsing us where we can't truly see the sun like we need to? I think Jesus talks a little bit about this, not in those words though, as he's uh, talking about the parable of the sower and the souls. And he explains this to his disciples in chapter 13, starting in verse 18. It says, therefore hear this parable of the sower when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away, what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. How is your heart? And what kind of heart do you have? Is it a softened heart? Is it a hardened heart? Have you examined yourself to see how well you receive the word of God? Stephen Covey said it this way, he said, Sow a thought, reap an action, sow an act, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character and reap a destiny. And what we figure out uh, in life is that the things in the heart, they're gonna come out. Those things will eventually come out in our lives. We can keep it planted for a while, but eventually it's going to come out. And that's the question we ask ourselves, how is our heart today? We can have a heart that becomes hardened. It oftentimes happens very gradually we start off with good intentions, but then things happen in our life and trials and temptations happen. We get apathetic to the word of God and we get spiritually stagnant. And those things can lead us away. In chapter 13, starting in verse 20, it says, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecutions arise because of this world, immediately he stumbles. How often do we see that? We receive it with joy, and then what happens? Things go off the track. I think Mike Tyson's the one that said, everyone has a plan until you get hit in the face, until you get hit in the mouth, and that's true. We have plans, and they said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, because they're going to change. Things are going to happen. When we have those trials and the tribulations in life, what do we do with it? Do we go off back into the world? Do we stay strong? What kind of ground do we have? Is it very shallow? Is it easily impressionable? Are we influenced by others? Do we have very little stability in our spiritual walk? In verse 22, it says, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. The, uh, Luke, if you look at his account, as the word cares. Oftentimes these cares and, and things of the world, they're not typically evil in themselves, 
but they can effectively choke out the word of God. They can ch choke out things in our life, spiritually speaking. And that happens to so many people. They allow the things of this world to come in and to take them away and not serve God as we should. You ever think about what exactly is keeping us from seeing the sun each day? What's keeping us from walking the life that we should walk? What's keeping us from being prepared to, to serve others, to teach others? What's preparing us each time that we come to services? Are we mentally and physically and emotionally prepared to hear the word of God? And then what are we going to do with it once we receive it? How is your heart today? Is it being eclipsed? What's eclipsing your spiritual, your spiritual world today? There are some people that profess that they're just simply weak. Have you ever said that? I'm just spiritually weak. Sometimes people say that for decades. And you have to ask the question is, why are we so weak after so long of being a Christian? How much effort are we putting into our spiritual life? Are we trying to get better? Are we trying to get stronger each day? What's keeping us from getting stronger? That's what we need to remove those things in our life. That's our thoughts this evening. What's, what is eclipsing our growth? And the question is, do we really want to grow? And if we really want to grow spiritually, it takes work. But I can tell you this, it's going to be worth it in the end. That's our thoughts this evening. If we can assist you anyway with your walk with the Lord, we're going to invite you to come as we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Tis the grandest thing through the ages wrong. Tis the grandest thing for a mortal. Tis the grandest thing that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. I said, oh, pray, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest thing in the earth or man. Tis the grandest thing for a mortal strength. Tis the grandest thing tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin or pride go to him for rest our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest Lot the tidings roll to a guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, He will make the whole our God he is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is Sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Please be seated. I have just a couple of announcements here. Uh, hospice has been called in for Helen Deering and Joanne Brown is out ill and let's don't forget our gospel singing Saturday at 5 o'clock and then Sunday morning starts our gospel meeting with DJ Dickerson that's all I'll try to, to be here every opportunity that we have uh, and don't forget to 
cookouts at the Sharks after the Sunday morning worship service Sunday. And also don't forget to clean out your pews. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? If not, if you'll stand, Brother Archie Brown will lead us in closing prayer. Father, we come before thee at this time thanking you for this hour of service to you. We pray that all things done here will bring joy and honor and glory to your precious name. We pray, our Father, for those mentioned that are sick and afflicted and unable to be here this evening. We pray you lay your healing hands upon them and restore them back to the most wanted health. We pray for those that are grieving over the loss of a loved one. We pray you you will comfort them at this time and may the one that has departed this life, may he be prepared to go to the home with you in the ha after a while. We are ever thankful, our Father, for our good health, but we, we know that sometimes uh, we don't take care of ourselves and we fall short of illnesses and everything, but you, we pray that you'll help us to get out of this so that we can come back and serve you with all our strength. We pray, our Father, that you will be with Brother Thomas and his family, and that he will be strong and serve you all of the days of his life. We pray that for Brother uh, Dickerson, we pray for him to come with the strengths of the year that you put behind him and that he'll be ready to break into us the bread of life. And we pray for a long life in your service for him. We pray, our Father, you'll take us to our home now and forgive us of our sins as we repent of them. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.